First of all, as a co-host of the Futurology series, I want to welcome you to this event. I've been given 15 minutes to talk about things that I think would be relevant to all of us Indonesians and hopefully many of you distinguished guests from outside Indonesia. I want to talk about the history of Indonesia and I want to talk about where we are today and I want to talk about where we could be and where we want to be. If we go back a few billion people globally in hundreds of years, in the first millennium, Indonesia was able to put a mark on the global landscape by way of the supremacy and the prominence of a number of dynasties. I think one prominent one that comes up is that of the Shailendra. This was in the seventh century, which I've told many people in Indonesia and outside, where they were able, or we were able to build the largest Buddhist temple in the world. It's a structure, it's a construct that is equipped with about six square platforms that's topped by circular platforms and embellished with over 2,500 reliefs and hundreds of Buddha statues. And this was basically the manifestation of not only Indonesia's economy, but also diplomacy, culture, and to a lot of extent, geopolitics. And for a few hundred years, a few hundred million people later, about seven centuries to be almost exact, Indonesia went through a reawakening. This was in the 14th century, where we had the brilliance of a pati, or a prime minister by the name of Gajah Mada. Gajah Mada was probably one of the most exemplary servants of the public who assisted the then king by the name of Hayam Wuruk. And they were able to manifest Indonesia's economic prowess and geopolitical prowess, cultural, social, diplomatic, and what have you. Thereafter, Indonesia kind of hibernated for hundreds of years and until the world grew in population by a few more hundreds of million. Then we kind of had a wake-up call. That wake-up call, which was precipitated by a few events of geopolitical importance, it took place in 1945 when Indonesia became independent and it marked the end of colonialism and imperialism. Indonesia was able to show its teeth, its strength, and its desire. And it marked the beginning of a new journey. Decades later, the world was about as bipolar as we had seen it or as many people wanted it. But then the Cold War ended about 20 years ago when that bipolarity ended. The intuition at that time was that the world was going to be singularized. But it actually became more multipolar. Emerged the centers of power in India, in the Middle East, in Africa, in Brazil or South America, and in Asia by way of China and India and what we call ourselves Southeast Asia. It kind of looks and sounds familiar with what happened in the last two millennia. And Indonesia was able to grow economically, politically, although we went through some trials and tribulations. 1997 was probably the most testing trial. I was there as a banker. My salary dropped by 85% in real terms. I felt it, I sensed it, and it was felt by millions of Indonesians. We were politically, economically, diplomatically, socially, culturally moribund. 
But somehow, we were able to wake up. And we went through an experiment called democracy. Democracy was just getting started in Indonesia with the transitioning of times and governments under the leadership of Habibi, Guzdur, Megawati, and the maturing process just got better and better until President SBY got elected in 2004, the first ever directly elected president, who basically took on whatever took place before him and tried to shape the country. And this was in 2004, which is in the 21st century. It's funny, because if we look back 2,000 years, Indonesia seems to be projecting its prominence every seven centuries. It's what I call the cycle of seven. The seventh century, the Shalendras, the 14th century, the Majapahit, and the 21st century. This is, I think, the time for us. And we sit on the back of, I think, a pretty damn good economic footprint and foundation whereby we have sorted out our monetary issue, we have sorted out our fiscal issues, we have sorted out a good chunk of our political issues where I think we can leapfrog going forward. The picture up there is what I think will define our future. And this is what I think will define our future. What will define where we can go, where we want to be. The demographic bonus is such that we are what we call ourselves the Selena Gomez generation. I used to say to Justin Bieber, but the girls got mad. <laughs> if we start off with one trillion US dollars today, in terms of our economic size, and we were to grow just at 5% real growth per year, and add to that 5% inflation rate, and if we were to assume linearity and grow it for 20 years, this is the accumulation of our economic pie in the next 20 years. It's staggering. 60 trillion US dollars. That's how much cake. The catch is there is no disruptions, whether it's in the form of a bomb explosion, a tsunami, an earthquake, or a political blow up that could derail our future. Now we take a look at the next. This is where we could be 